You're listening to the Struck Podcast. I'm Dan Blewett. I'm Alan Hall. And here on Struck, we talk about everything aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection. All right, welcome back to the Struck Podcast. Uh, in today's episode, we are going to cover a bunch of interesting topics. Number one, there was a recent uh, engine fire causing an emergency landing with an A320, so we're going to chat a little bit about that. Uh, in our engineering segment, the 777X, so obviously Boeing's had a lot of press recently, most of it bad, but we're going to talk a little bit about the engineering in the 777X and their folding wing, wing tips, which is pretty cool technology. Uh, we're going to chat more about the Boeing 737 Max. Obviously, the congressional report just came out today. We're not going to touch on that in this episode, but we are going to talk a little bit about some of the executives and uh, the, de- the de- design process and their defense of it. And then we're going to chat a little more about the Auto Solera 500L, so the Auto Aviation. They're one of their really unique jets, um, well, planes. Uh, they have some crazy efficiency claims. We touched on it last time. We're going to chat a little bit more about it today. And then lastly, in our EVTOL segment, we're going to talk about the Auto Flight V400, uh, which is a unique cargo, um, you know, electric vehicle that's coming out of, it looks like China. And we will chat about it and as well as maybe some of the bigger models that auto flight is going to be spurring off of that one. So Alan, how are you, sir? Let's jump right in. The A320 had an engine fire this weekend. Uh, it was an American airlines or this week an American airlines, Airbus A320, they landed safely, but how common is this? How scary is this? I mean, what's your take here? It's not common to have engine fires, obviously, and it, it usually raises some red flags with all the certification authorities when that happens and all the mechanics that are associated with it and the pilots, too. So there'll be paperwork filed. Um, it'll get reported. Uh, and you, if you actually follow the aviation safety databases, you'll see those list of incidences pop up. So you, you can actually scan uh, mm-hmm. how many times they've had brake problems, landing gear problems, don't deploy, flaps don't work. It, it's actually pretty common. Now, the en- engine fire is a different level, right? Fire's bad on any airplane, uh, but things that break are, are pretty common. So the the driver here is that uh, there's been a lot of uh, engine-related issues re- lately um, just because of the newer designs that are trying to drive efficiency way, way up. Uh, and when you do that, you can have some funky things happening. Remember, all these engines today are all electric- electronically controlled. There's a lot of highly efficient, um, highly refined stuff going on inside an engine. So and, and on top of it, they're made not to catch fire, right? So something yeah. has gone really wrong here. And it'll the engine be pulled off, tore down, looked at, right? And they'll try to find a root cause to it and then alert any everybody if it's related to some other issue that's going on it's but it's a it's a serious issue you know it clearly is well so one question here i've got for you so i've been reading a book called the black swan it's got by a guy uh nasim nicholas taleb and he talks about these black swan events that essentially you couldn't predict from the the day prior right so as I'm reading this, and of course, this is there's so many examples of stuff like this. You know, the Boeing 737 is clearly like a black swan event for them. Um, but here, with an engine, like these engines are super reliable, and they're yeah. fine on Monday, fine on Tuesday, catches fire on Wednesday. I mean, how is there is there a way that we can know that this engine's gonna you know fly and take off six you know six flights today, but tomorrow it's gonna catch fire? Is there any way that engineers, I mean, obviously there's a lot of, you know, like we know when the oil gets low, like we know when there's indicator lights, there's lots and lots of sensors, but right. how do, how does this get missed? Or is this just like something broke off, something like catastrophically failed? And is there a better way to, to catch these things? It could be a catastrophic failure inside the engine, and that's what's going to set all the uh, engineering groups <laughs> on edge with <laughs> it there's a catastrophic but remember that engines and pretty much anything on aircraft today are data logged there's a flight mm-hmm. data recorder it's recording a lot of parameters about the aircraft and engines themselves tend to have some sort of data logging ability so they're monitoring you can actually download what has happened transpired with that engine before the the, the catastrophic event has happened and try to back engineer what the engine was going through. So maybe there's something that they didn't pick up or didn't flag soon enough, mm-hmm. typically a vibration of some sort um, that 
would be unusual. I, I th you know, engine catching fire is, is a huge thing. So all the all the monitoring systems that are on an engine are all there in some part one to, to great to get great fuel efficiency, but two, but to make the, sure the, the engine performs correctly and doesn't have a fire. Uh, but you know, there are fire suppression systems on engines uh, to extinguish those things because you, you, there's actually firewalls there. And I know it's hard to think about on an airplane. There actually is a firewall. There is a physical firewall between the engine and the rest of the aircraft to, to stop that fire from propagating further on into the aircraft. So there is, there's actually burn tests that are involved that uh, I think it's a five minute at 2000 degrees burn test that I've seen in action and it's amazing to watch because there, there's all kinds of components like go, that pass through this firewall. There's all connectors and plumbing and all this stuff. And yet it has to stand these really high temperatures for a really long time. So, you know, there are safety systems built into the aircraft to contain fire, stop fire, but on the other side, the preventative monitoring systems, uh, you would think will, will be uh, looked at, downloaded, evaluated by engineers to see if they could pick up anything ahead of time and diagnose it and then pass that along if need to be to the other airline operators, <coughs> excuse me, other airline operators that um, they can detect this soon enough. Because there's, there's been a couple of, of engine issues in general lately. Uh, and mostly related to sort of newer technology where tends to be the issue right because we get everybody's getting pushed and pushed and pushed to more higher higher fuel efficiency you know you, you're with the new technology it doesn't have the minute flout hours so this is when things like this pop up all right so in our engineering segment today we're going to cover a bunch of things the first one is the boeing 777x this one has folding wingtips so, Alan, right off the bat, what is why do we need folding wingtips? So, the triple seven and some of the larger aircraft, uh, and they're on the drawing boards today, have fold up wingtips so they can fit into the existing slots at the airports because the jetways are kind of set at the airports, especially in the United States. The jetways are kind of set up for like, you know, 737, A320 type airplanes with certain wingspans. And if you start stacking the airplanes in closer, uh, and if, if you actually watch in different airports around the world, you'll see where they've collided wingtips uh, as they're getting tugged around or moved mm. around. So you want to kind of give yourself a little more space. Right? So you, you fold up the wingtips. It gives you the uh, ability to slide into those parking spots. It's essentially what it is. And in the automotive world, there must be things over time that allow us to get into smaller, smaller spaces. But on airplanes, as the airplanes get... Um, longer flights. The wings have gotten longer. Like 787 has really long wings for its fuselage, relatively speaking. Set and the 777 will also. The actual how also. So uh, we've been pull, folding wingtips is not a new thing, right? We any type of aircraft carrier, air, airplane has fold up wingtips so they can stack more aircraft on on the carrier closer together and get them down below mm -hmm. deck also right so that the technology boeing airbus all those major aircraft companies have been doing the fold-up wing ticks on the military side forever so it's not a huge leap to to do those things now on civilian aircraft it's just unusual to see it i think uh it will become well if you ever get back to international flying again you're going to see more and more of the folded wingtips because of the efficiency of the aircraft needs to be there got it so let's jump to the auto solera 500l and we're going to finish here with boeing 737 because i know you've got a lot more to say about that so we we chatted about the auto solera 500l last week mm -hmm. and obviously there's a lot of commentary on the web and we were part of that as well is just like unconventional shape makes a lot of big claims, right? right? It also might not have the sex appeal to, you know, be the number one choice of some business jet owners or prospective business jet owners who want this yep. like sleek cool factor. So all these things are just yeah. part of the overall pie. Obviously, the biggest thing with this is that it's a unique innovative design. It's yeah. uh, got some pretty crazy claims of efficiency. So let's talk a little bit more about those efficiency claims. Um, as far as using laminar flow, is that I know we've talked about the the, the Lear uh, fan in the past. So mm -hmm. this isn't necessarily a brand new design, but it's continuing to push the limits of it. So I mean, right. what's your take with laminar flow? I mean, are they is this sort of cutting edge to try to glide this far and get so much out of glide? No, it's not. But uh, like I like we talked about before, the the yeah the 
computer power to actually draw laminar flow and make it into reality. And you have the ability with composites to get really smooth surfaces because you can omit fasteners, uh, rivets, and bolts and that kind of thing that actually penetrate through the wing skin or on the fuselage itself. So you get rid of all the the uh, the roughened bits. You know, and when every time you put a fastener into a wing skin, it's aerodynamically inefficient. So mm-hmm. you don't want to do that, right? Uh, and if you look at the Honda jet, which is a lot of laminar flow, particularly up and basically from the nose back into the cockpit, that thing is smooth and the wing is smooth. Now, I think they do that via uh, obviously manufacturing capabilities, but fillers and coatings to smooth everything out to make that sure that <laughs> that surfaces are very, very smooth. Uh, and, and so everybody's going down the same pathway. Uh, by aerospace is going down that pathway, trying to create laminar flow wings. Yeah, it's very, very, very doable today with composite technology and with the computational resources we have to, to, to make a laminar flow airplane. It's a question of how far laminar can you make it? How far back is laminar flow going to exist? Uh, and, you know, that's really, you're not going to know too much until you actually make the aircraft. Gotcha. And one of the, the claims that got some scrutiny was that it maybe only has a 300 foot uh, run up from takeoff. So that seems really short. Right. Yeah, that doesn't seem like a real number. Um, yeah, it just depends how much weight's on it and how they've changed the shape of the wing for short takeoff. Maybe they have some. In, if, you, if you're watching, if you're flying a seven thirty seven, you'll see leading edge slats and flaps and stuff to change, basically change the shape of the wing as you take off to provide more lift. It's essentially mm-hmm. how it works. Um, so you can do funky things like that, but. As I think it's going to be the case on this aircraft, like every other aircraft, when you start doing things like that um, to, to improve performance in one aspect, you're taking away in another. And it's usually in terms of weight. Uh, if you go back and look historically at programs that have had trouble, they've had trouble with weight. So you can make the slickest, smoothest, fastest, longest flying, all this, all these things, all that true i mean you can draw it up and can you know do the analysis put it in the wind tunnel and do the whole thing and yeah you can you can do it but at the end of the day you got it one you got to certify it and two um you need to have some really really good numbers on weight because weight kills so many different programs and i went back i went back and watched uh the, there was a documentary made about the Lear fan and the Lear fan ended about 1985 or so when that finally shut down. So there was, there was a seven ish year program from sort of start to finish and watched that. And the, the documentary kind of stepped through the, the years of the program and all the issues that they had. But the biggest problem was from what I could pick out of it was they had a structural failure in a wing that they had to go deal with and they didn't want to redesign the wing because it's composite and it has all this tooling associated with it. So they wanted to st- stiffen it. So adding stiffeners uh, increases weight. And they had a failure also on, uh, it looked like the pressurization and taking it up to, to max FAA cert pressure. And they had some sort of mechanical failure there and they ended up adding more weight to go fix it. So all the range numbers for the aircraft all of a sudden just collapse because you've had all this extra weight. So even though the aircraft externally looks the same, once mm-hmm. you blow up that weight, it just is not as efficient anymore. And I think the Starship ran into the same problem, uh, the Beach Starship. I mean, Beach Starship was sort of the, in the, the Beach Starship sort of killed the Lear fan, so to speak, because Beach had a larger uh, marketing sales group. They had traction with the King Airs. And so walking in from a, a King Air owner to a Starship owner was sort of the philosophy and it's the future. And there was just a lot of things that could happen simultaneously that Beach could do that Lear fan could not do. And, but even the Beach Starship, which had plenty of funding, and they did make the thing, I think they made 53 total, and that was it. It's too heavy. Mm-hmm. And they got in the same, same kind of conundrum as the Lear fan did, which is um, too heavy. So you know, that's your trouble, right? And in today's world, back in the 80s when a lot of this was going on, keeping track of weight was essentially a, a means of having a person count all the bolts and all the fasteners and all the stuff and weigh it before they put it in and try to estimate how much the total weight of the aircraft's going to be. 
In today's world, you can kind of do it via uh, the CAD system, CATIA systems. The, so every part has an associated weight with it. So when you look at a drawing, you can get an affiliated w associated weight for that component. And so you get a better stack of what the weight is. What, I, what I'm hearing on a lot of different projects right now is that none of them meet their uh, goal weight or their sold weight that they're marketing when the first thing starts. And none of them ever do that. And it comes down to, I think, a combination of not having certification issues or just being really cutting marginal on some of the structural things so they can reduce the weight. But then when they get to the actual test, it doesn't work. So you got to you gotta fix it fast. And so it ends up being heavier. The Horizon, like the Beach Horizon, which is the... Or the Raytheon Horizon, which is now the 4000, has similar issues too, right? It's a composite. It was a composite fuselage, and um, they're doing some structural testing, and it broke. And so they end up putting a bunch of what we call scabs onto it to stiffen it mm -hmm. up. So, all, all so the the auto aviation as a concept probably could deliver on the numbers if if it's experimental aircraft and it's got you know two seats in it and a propeller in the back and it can keep the weight down and it can do all these things. But as soon as you start getting into the certification world and have to put, um, you know, it's just the stuff that goes on an airplane. There's all kinds of stuff goes in an airplane. You think, why, like what, why do I need a coffee maker on an airplane? It's just dead weight, but the customer won't buy it without the coffee maker. Or I need to put a restroom in the back of the airplane, which it's only a two hour flight, but yeah. people demand they have the restroom in the back and it's not light. So Rather have it, have it needed then, you know, need it, right? not have so, it. Yeah. So there's a lot of, um, compromises that are made and that's all weight. And so as the, uh, the sort of the, uh, top people, uh, chief engineers, so to speak of these programs are, are constantly monitoring the weight, 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 because the aerodynamics are the aerodynamics. I think it's killing them. Well, engine performance, but you can always tend to squeeze more engine performance out because they're mm -hmm. downrated, so you can squeeze more out. So uh, fuel burn, weight. And fuel burn is related to weight. <laughs> so it's all about weight. And, and well, that's where these things struggle. Yeah. And so, I mean, they're one of their big claims is, and it just seems like it blows other jets out of the water, which is fuel economy is about eight times better. So 18 to mm -hmm. 25 miles per gallon as a pair, compared to two to three, which helps keep their operating costs at about $328 per hour as opposed mm -hmm. to $2,100 for a typical jet and then their range is almost more than double so 4500 uh versus 21 um that's uh nm Possible. i'm actually blanking but you know so i mean those seems those seem pretty crazy to the point where it's like why hasn't this done, been done before i guess is the question like if these mm -hmm. claims are if this design is like let's just blow everything out of the water why hasn't it happened to this point uh, that's a good question um I think it's weight. <laughs> I really I think it comes back Just down back to, weight. to weight. I think it comes back down to weight uh, and be able to, to deliver it. If you can make, you can put a lot of fuel in an airplane if, if you get rid of a lot of the weight and got fuel storage for it. So you can fly a long ways. So I just think eventually you got to get to real weight numbers. And if the weight numbers aren't there, it just won't perform. So let's shift here to the 737 MAX. Obviously, there's a lot going on right now. The congressional thing just came out. And mm. uh, report aside, uh, earlier this week, some former top Boeing officials uh, who worked on the 737 Max, they defended the design process. And mm -hmm. I know you have some some strong opinions about that. So tell me about this situation here, because a lot of people don't understand the inner workings of Boeing. Yeah, so unless you've been around it, or any larger aircraft company, it's hard to understand how they function. Uh, but I, I think the thing that was interesting that stood out to me at first was they had and I don't. I think both of these. Well, one of them. One of them had retired, I think, and the other one was actually still working on another program. So, they were. They weren't like they were. Uh, these these engineers weren't like they were tossed out of Boeing for poor performance. That wasn't the case. Now, what I think the argument that that the engineers were making was essentially this: we followed the design process. We we know how to build aircraft. We built building a lot of different aircraft for a number of different years since this. 50s, let's call it, when civilian aircraft since the 60s. And we follow this process, we, and we've a process that's been sort of honed over time. So it doesn't, it, we didn't arrive yesterday and try to start designing airplanes, it just didn't. 
And at the same thing for the FAA, matter of fact. Uh, there seems to be some discussion whether the FAA is competent or not. Well, that's, that's <laughs> not even an argument, right? That, that, that's, that's, that's a very simplistic way of looking at the world. That's not what goes on. The, 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 the people at the FAA are competent people. There's no doubt about that. I mean, they are the, uh, you know, there's two organizations in the aviation world that are looked at as being the top. And, and then you can always, EASA and the FAA, you know, those are the two, pretty much. Uh, and I, I, the engineers at, at Boeing are basically saying that uh, having and going through that process again, they would have made the same decisions because the decision criteria, whether it was right, let's say right or wrong, or if it met, the F, I think it came down to did it meet the FAA criteria, yes or no. And I haven't heard a discussion that it didn't meet the FAA criteria. I think it came down to uh, what seems to be evolving down into how much time you give a pilot to recover an aircraft, and mm-hmm. which is something that was predefined before that program started, which it, it tends to be four seconds. And you see four seconds used a lot. And I, I have to go pull the FAA um, guidance on that, where the four seconds comes from. But four seconds is tossed around a lot, right? So if you can recover the air, you can discern or problem solve what's going on and, and correct the situation as the pilot in four seconds everything works which is what i'm sure the boeing analysis show that if you have a runaway pitch pitch trim system regardless of what the cause is you reach down you turn off the switches which is what happened in one of the flights the previous flight to the to the accident flight is that they had a guy riding in the jump seat another pilot riding in the jump seat who had that situation happen had the mcas kick in and he reached over and turned off the horizontal stabilizer trim so from a Boeing engineering perspective, going line by line on what the pay- failure modes are and all that kind of stuff, I think they're making a pretty good argument. Like, we did it the way that it was supposed to be done. We didn't go outside the system. We weren't cowboys out there doing what we felt was the best thing or what we thought would save Boeing some money. Obviously, money and schedule come into every aircraft program like they do for every thing that's being built and anybody and it doesn't matter what the project is from a building to a car to an airplane to spacex they're all under schedule and cost constraints that's part of being an engineer so uh, you get this sort of outrageous to me it's sort of outrageous comments like well there's a schedule and oh my gosh there's all this undue pressure because it, it, they didn't want to spend another billion dollars on the program yeah <laughs> Yes, we're all adults here. We all realize that those are the constraints we're working under. But it doesn't mean you're working outside the system or or, or, in, or intentionally uh, removing safety to cause crashes. There's no upside to a crash. There just isn't. So I can hear, I can see why the Boeing engineers are coming back and, and basically saying, hey, we did it to the process. We met the FAA's criteria. And if, if given the, the knowledge I had at the time, would I do that again? And I think, the answer has been, yeah, sure. And, and Dan, you could see that too. I mean, there's in all kinds of different work environments, there's always costs and time constraints. What's new mm-hmm. about that? Yeah, it just gets, uh, you know, the finger pointed at it when something bad happens. It's like, well, you know, couldn't you have slowed down or could you have done this? Sure. Or was the budget the issue? It's like, well, but it's always the issue. Like that stuff's always, like you said, it's always a constraint. Yeah. So yeah, it seems hard to sort out for sure. And it seems like everyone right now is rushing to, point their fingers at Boeing, but you said maybe there's a good amount more that the public just isn't quite grasping. Yeah, it's a little more complicated of a problem. It definitely is. All right, so in our final segment today, we're going to chat a little bit about uh, our latest uh, EVTOL. So this one out of China is the Autoflight V400. And it's really just a prototype right now, so it's not real big. It's got a it's a cargo uh, vehicle essentially, so it's got a hundred kilogram payload, which is not a lot. That's like you know two average households Amazon deliveries for a week, right? Um, <laughs> you know, nine meter wingspan, about uh, one meter high, uh, six point uh, six seven meters long. A really interesting design. So, Alan, what what strikes you about this design? And, and tell me a little bit about the way it takes off and gets going and it's definitely yeah, unique it, compared to some of the other ones that we've seen. It, it is. It, it's sort of the most simplistic take on uh, you can get on vertical takeoff 
<laughs> and landing because there's just a whole separate system to lift it vertically and there's a whole separate system to propel it forward and <laughs> horizontally so it's like oh well it's just like a cessna skymaster has got to propel on the front propel on the back to move it forward and skymaster never really thought that was a great concept uh that's why the aircraft's not produced today and then the the helicopter portion of it the vertical lift and landing portion are, are just blades hanging out there in the open mm-hmm. so it is sort of simplistic in that sense but sometimes brute force works particularly if you're moving cargo and uh if the goal is to move uh cargo from a to b then yeah, it may be something efficient. You know that I what I was occurring to me about that program was, it would it would suffice for getting equipment, medical supplies, um, like you said, Amazon deliveries out into the Amazon or someplace where you don't mm-hmm. have a lot of truck traffic, right? That you could actually like Alaska tends to be that way. There's a lot of little islands in Alaska that tends to be that way, and a lot of deliveries are made to Alaska via like old Cessna aircraft uh, that are just rigged up for cargo or twin otters or those kind of aircraft, which are sort of the lifeline of of a lot of communities in rural locations like Alaska. So I think you know taking the pilot out of it, making autonomous. Okay, I get it, uh, but. <laughs> the the thing about being made in China is is that you have the force of government to look the other way when it wants to. Uh, if you're trying to do that in the United States, you would not have the FAA looking the other way while you develop this thing and maybe test flew it over populated areas. Uh, that would be a big no no. So it gives you a slight competitive advantage because you can go out and do things uh, and with less risk than you would, or and less oversight probably, than you would be able to do here in the States or, or in, definitely in Europe, which the population centers are a lot more closely aligned to one another. Um, so you, you kind of wonder for a little bit of a competitive disadvantage, but um, I, I it's it's all carbon fiber. It's, it's it has all the stuff. Um, you wonder if they're you know using some of the knowledge that they've gleaned off some of the military programs, trying to put that on to some civilian cargo projects. But uh, it's going to be just like you know we talked about it an EV two L that was associated with a hotel. Remember the one we were talking about that was associated with the hotel chain. It was mm-hmm. like an amusement park ride mm-hmm. that did that wasn't certified either, but it was it was authorized. It was, what was the right words? Was it authorized for use at the hotel and its complexes? <laughs> so yeah. it's like, well, you know, it's an amusement park ride, just like a roller coaster, except it flies at a thousand feet and and can fall out of the sky. Uh, <laughs> so I'd imagine this thing is going to be in that sort of same vein for a while. Yeah. Keep looking up. Yeah. Well, and this one, it, it also seems like it's a precursor. So Auto Flight also has like a bigger brother version. So the V1000, mm-hmm. which they haven't really released specs on how much uh, cargo, how fast its cruising speed it would be, you know, its cargo payload, all like all that stuff. So that yeah. one is even further in the distance. But, you know, this prototype's interesting. It's definitely different than other ones we've seen. And uh, it just seems like like they're just starting their foray into like, hey, we've got some working prototypes and experimental right. stuff, and then we're gonna keep moving. Which you know, everyone's at a, seems like at a different point uh, in this whole yes. electric <laughs> market. So yeah, just got no a new doubt. new a new player. Yep. Well, that's gonna do it for today's episode of Struck. So if you're new here, thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe and uh, find us on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, anywhere you listen to podcasts. Be sure to check out our website, weatherguardarrow.com, where we have tons of articles, all of our podcasts, videos, and you can get in touch with us if you need to learn more about lightning protection for your aircraft radome. So thanks again for listening, and we will see you here next week on the Struck Podcast. Mm-hmm.